expelled the last king, Ar Pharazon. He converted the king to worship Morgoth, instructed him to build a huge domed temple with an altar of fire and to make human sacrifices. He inspired the Numenorians to become slavers, uh, imperial capitalists, and he filled their land with fortresses, and temples, and tombs, and even engines, mechanized engines. So just as Sauron and Saruman are tainted by technology, so the industrialization of Numenor in the Second Age is not depicted as, as, as progress, but as the triumph of a totalitarian evil. And it, was, it is ultimately catastrophic. Indeed, in The Lost Road, this Numenorian modernity, as Christopher Tolkien summarizes, amounts to the withdrawal of a besotted and aging king from public view, the unexplained disappearance of people unpopular with the government, informers, prisons, torture, secrecy, fear of the night, propaganda in the form of the rewriting of history, and the multiplication of weapons of war, including metal ships that travel without sails, fortifications, and missiles. So in other words, in other versions of Numenor, Tolkien's thinking very much about what's going on in the 1930s. That whole range of state terrorism, threat, incarceration, revising history, was as pressing to Tolkien as it was to a writer such as George Orwell. Orwell's response uh, was to write 1984, the near future dystopia and animal farm, his allegory. Tolkien's response was to gothicize fascism, to make fascism gothic. It's also seen in his darkly humorous badge for the Mordor Special Mission Flying Corps, in other words, the, the Mordor um, Air Force. He hated, he hated uh, the idea of aeroplanes uh, bringing, uh, being used in warfare. But this history is at the same time unquenchable. You, you can't escape it. Aragorn is a figure who comes bearing the weight of history to threaten Sauron. He's described by Eomer as a walking legend. He says, dreams and legends spring to life out of the grass. The hobbits too are fabled folk. Do we walk in legends? So those ideas of the past and repressed history turn out to be irrepressible. They can't be kept down. Even the Barrow Whites show that history may be entombed but refuses to die. And in having that undead agency influence, they help to knit the plot of the Lord of the Rings together. The ancient blade with which Merry stabs the Lord of the Nazgul was actually forged, it was made for precisely that reason, hundreds of years before in the war against the Witch King of Angmar in the north. Similarly, the dwarves delved too deep in Moria and awoke a Balrog. In his earlier drafts for this um, episode, Tolkien described a Balrog as an avenger sent from Mordor. But he rewrote the passage to make the demon part of the hidden history of the mines. So in other words, it's already there. It's part of the untold history that then explodes. So history merges with the contemporary. And the shadow of the past is not only inescapable, but it defines the present. The elf Gildor points out to the hobbits as they're leaving the Shire that the Shire is not a country retreat, but is caught up in history too. The wide world, Gildor says, is all about you. You can, fence your, you can fence yourselves in, but you cannot forever fence it out. Tolkien, in fact, said, I much prefer history true or feigned, in other words, made up. Now, the explosion in popularity of the Gothic literary genre at the end of the 18th century is a familiar chapter in English literary history. But other things were happening in the 19th century as well. And the Gothic was not simply a cry of horror at social change. It was also very mainstream and in opposition to urbanization and to industrial capitalism. So this is the Victorian Gothic revival movement, which was a deliberate return to medieval styles in architecture and culture. And it's seen most vividly in huge new building projects, such as the Palace of Westminster, designed by Augustus Welby Pugin. Also seen in the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, 
and in William Morris's Arts and Crafts Movement, and Tolkien admitted that he was influenced by William Morris. Now, this wide-ranging movement combined earlier researches into chivalry and behaviour, um, which interestingly blossomed most uh, stirringly in this recreation of a medieval um, tournament in 1839. Combine that with the more extravagant building projects of Horace Walpole at Strawberry Hill. So this became a visionary form of medievalism that produced both structurally sound buildings but also a model for Christian living. So the Gothic became a pattern for rethinking, for redeveloping community relations in a Christian society. And the practices of medieval craftsmen, um, building pointed arches and ribbed vaulting and flying buttresses, received an enthusiastic new lease of life. Now, in his own work, Pugin suggested that it was the social relations of medieval society that enabled them to produce their greatest works of cathedrals and abbeys. And in doing so, they spread their values of virtue. So corrupt societies, such as 19th century Britain, produced dismal architecture that alienated the people. In fact, in contrast, he contrasts them deliberately. That's the modern stuff. That's boring. Um, it's sort of depressing. It's alienating. Um, this is the medieval style, it's uplifting, um, it's engaging, um, it's Christian. So in other words, Pugin is arguing, if we adopt the latter, if we go back to raising uh, the soul, uh, we can um, come up with a better um, society. So the Gothic became, in the 19th century, by far the preferred style of architecture for schools and universities and churches. This had a problem at the heart of it, though. Understanding history in this way, as a progress, was already a Whig liberal narrative that had at its basis the defeat of the Middle Ages, and not just the Middle Ages, but the Catholic Middle Ages. Gothic was too much associated with liberal values of the Whigs, with parliamentarian values, it was also Protestant and profoundly anti-Catholic. In fact, the English Reformation was declared to be a repeat of the original 5th century Gothic rebellion against Roman tyranny. This time, it was argued that it was uh, standing against the Roman Catholic Church as opposed to Imperial Rome. The executed monarch Charles I had strong Catholic sympathies. And after, in England, William of Orange took the throne, an act of settlement ensured that succession to the English throne would remain exclusively Protestant. That was the nature of the progress uh, that the Whigs were um, advocating here. Of course, for Tolkien, this is doubly distressing. He was both a Catholic and a medievalist. So Tolkien doesn't write as Protestant writers did of the 18th and 19th centuries. They envisaged history as overcoming as defeating, as replacing the Catholicism of the Middle Ages. Rather, Tolkien is writing as a, an active medievalist, seeking to reconnect um, and revive the old northern identities. And in this, he's actually in the tradition of other Catholic Gothicists. Uh, Richard Verstegen, uh, for example, uh, wrote a restitution of the decayed intelligence um, in 1605. This attempted to restore Germanic national origins and early Catholicism to the English identity through arguments in which, based on philology and legendary evidence. And the parallels with Tolkien are very striking um, here. Edmund Burke, about whom I've spoken, uh, the architect of the sublime, was also a political Gothicist in his reflections on the revolution in France. He was born in Ireland uh, to a Catholic family, spent much of his time with his mother's Catholic farm, uh, family, uh, despite being sent to the Protestant University there. He never forgot his deep roots in Catholicism. Um, 
So, considering Tolkien's Middle, uh, Middle Earth, I think this tradition of Catholic Gothicism reveals that The Lord of the Rings is a work of the Gothic revival, but particularly of Pugin's Gothic revival. Pugin, like Tolkien after him, was a Roman Catholic and deplored the English Reformation and the destruction that it had uh, enacted upon medieval architecture and society and culture. So Pugin's aim was to revive medieval social structures, not as an expression of repressed guilt at the sometimes brutal course of progress, but because they were consistent with his faith, which was itself continuous with the Middle Ages. So he's aiming at continuity with the Catholic Middle Ages, unbroken by the Reformation. And Tolkien's Middle Earth is in the same tradition. Although Tolkien may have adopted many of the characteristics of Gothic novels, he did not write novels of terror or horror, but he investigates hospitality, chivalry, courage, social responsibility, and the challenges of progress in anxieties over rural and industrial transformation. It's also noticeable that the elements of the Gothic sublime that Tolkien does use are predominantly in the Lord of the Rings. There are far fewer in the Silmarillion, with the exception of the great tales of Beren and Luthien and Turin Tarambar and the Akalabeth. Now this is because much of the Silmarillion concerns the plight of the elves and elves are immortal. They do not have the same relationship with history um, as do the race of men or indeed hobbits. So it's only when the focus is on men that gothic motifs such as vampires and werewolves, doom and bewitchment, demonism and tyranny and all the other gothic paraphernalia become prominent. All of those spiritual and supernatural ways of disorientating or confusing the reader, the ways that are so beloved of Gothic novelists, um, are focused on the stories about men, because men have, from Iluvatar, what is described as the gift of death. Death, in other words, gothicizes time. This thing all things devours in the riddle game. And dying too, especially in martyrdom, is much more akin to Catholic than Protestant accounts. Before he wrote um, A Restitution of Decayed Intelligence, Verstigin had produced a Catholic martyrology, the theatre of cruelty, that detailed the persecution of Catholics. These Catholic martyrs are distinct from the Protestant martyrs uh, described by John Fox in his Acts and Monuments. They're less forensic, more transcendent, hidden from witnesses, passing into another realm. The death of Boromir, which happens off stage, um, effectively, is a prime example. And finally, Tolkien's Catholic Gothicism even suggests a covert Jacobitism to kings and, so and, and sovereignty. Two instances that stand out. The song sung at Lake Town, The King Beneath the Mountains Shall Come Into His Own, is based on a late 17th century ballad when the king enjoys his own again, which is sung by royalist and Catholic rebels throughout the rebellions against the Protestant monarch, known as the Jacobite rebellions. Similarly, the destiny of Aragorn, summed up in the title of volume three, The Return of the King, allude to the restoration of Charles II after the Republican Oliver Cromwell's Commonwealth. Tolkien did suggest different titles for his volumes but the return of the king was suggested from the outset. It's no coincidence. So for Tolkien, as for Verstegen and Pugh,